from Twitter. Why is, is morning routine so important? What two to three items should be a part of it? Why is the morning routine so important? Couple things. How you wake up has a scientifically proven impact on your ability to focus, on your happiness, and on your productivity all day. This is not something I've made up. This is well-established research. And I'm going to be explaining it to you in bite-sized pieces all week long. And so to preview it, we're going to be talking about this tomorrow morning. The two to three pieces of it are, for me, I wake up when the alarm goes off. And I'm going to explain the science why the snooze alarm is uh, horrendous for your productivity. It actually impacts the way that your brain functions when you do it. We'll explain that in a training this week. I then get up, and for the first couple minutes of the day, I plan my day. And I have a particular process that I go through that leverages something from Harvard Business School called the Progress Principle. Uh, I have a mindfulness practice. That could be anything that you want. It could be gratitude journaling. It could be meditation. It could be five slow, deep breaths. It could be taking your, your dog outside for a walk. And then on mornings when I can, I have a micro exercise practice where I do planks for five minutes or I do something to get my blood pumping on the mornings that I can. I, and I do all that before I ever even look at my phone because I put myself and my mindset first deliberately before I ever allow the world access to my mind. You do not want anybody to have access to what's going on up here until you've gotten deliberate about what you're thinking about first. Um, so that's a preview, but I'm going to, as I promised, this was going to be bite-sized stuff. If you've, if you've already watched the first 10 minutes of this, you got the training for today, which is the powerful connection between your mindset and your morning routine. And your morning routine begins the night before when you plug your phone outside of your bedroom and you go to bed without your phone anywhere near you. Um, the other reason why that's important is we know based on research that the blue light on these things impacts your ability to fall into a deep sleep. Sleep is essential for you to have a healthy mindset. And also when you wake up, if this is next to you, 87% of adults sleep with their phones or next to their phones. And 33% of adults check email in the middle of the night. And so whether you're willing to admit that or not, we want to break your habit of giving the world access to your mind and we want to make you more deliberate about how you are with your phone and the reason why is it has a direct scientific researched impact on your mood and your mindset all day so today um, we are building on the critical connection between having a positive deliberate healthy mindset and how you start the day and what your morning routine is uh, by way of recap we've already covered why uh, the number one thing about your morning routine is that the night before you plug your phone in outside of your bedroom, you can leave the ringer on, turn notifications off. If somebody needs to reach you, they can call you, but otherwise you're going to bed. That's number one. Number two, the second the alarm rings, you are to wake up. No hitting the snooze button. Yesterday, I explained in great detail the scientific reason why you do not want to hit the snooze button. Um, and the fact that based on research, it is medically proven that when you hit the snooze button and doze off to sleep, you put your brain in a state of sleep inertia, which impacts your ability to focus, your ability to be positive, your ability to process information for up to four hours. That is why it is critical. And step two of your morning routine is when that alarm rings, you five, four, three, two, one, use the five second rule and get out of bed. Now, number three, that's what we're talking about today. The third piece of your morning routine is that for the first 10 to 30 minutes of the day, the first 10 to 30 minutes of the day, that time is reserved for your dreams. That time is reserved for you. That time is time that you need to protect. You are not to pick up your phone. Do not turn on the television. Do not turn on the radio. No outside world input. All I want you to do for the first 10 to 30 minutes of the day is I want you to give those 10 to 30 minutes to your dreams. 
I think your dreams deserve 10 minutes, don't you? And you're not going to give them 10 minutes if the first thing that you do is pick up your phone. It's just not going to happen. Your attention is under siege all day long. All day long, the world is trying to sell you something or they're trying to serve up something that's salacious or tempting or curiosity provoking in order to get your limbic system, which is the interior part of your brain, the fight or flight, the part of your brain that's triggered by emotion and fear. They're trying to trick you to pay attention to things that just don't matter to your dreams, to your day-to-day -day life, to your family. And that is why it is critical, 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 critical that the first 10 minutes are reserved for you and your dreams. Now, you may be asking, what is it that you should be doing in those 10 to 30 minutes? I'm so glad you asked because I have a gift to give you today. Um, I have developed a journaling method. I'm not selling you anything. Don't worry. I'm actually giving you something for free. I've developed a journaling method uh, that I worked on for the last three years. I've spoken, I, I've, I've taught it to thousands and thousands and thousands of people around the world, whether I'm teaching it from a stage or whether I've uh, incorporated it into other courses or the other training videos that we've done online. This is a journaling method that I use. It takes less than five minutes. It's backed by science. And what I'm gonna do for the rest of the week is I'm gonna walk you step by step through the various prompts that I use in the first 10 minutes of my day to anchor my mood on something positive, to focus on the one thing that matters to me today to practice gratitude and to draw boundaries between the things that I need to do and when I need to cut off access to work and when I need to stop working so that I can have a little bit of focus time with my family or with myself for self care, taking care of myself, whatever. Um, the gift that I'm giving you is in the email that's going out today, we are going to give you a link to the PDF of the five second journal. Um, you're going to get one. You're going to get the page that we that I fill out every single morning for free. You can look at it on your phone. You can um, print it out if you want. You can use it uh, if you want it. You can of course go to Amazon, but that's not the point of giving it to you. I'm doing these live trainings and I'm teeing up this information because it is so important for you to get deliberate about what you're doing in order to improve your life. And so I want to share with you what I do every morning. I'm going to share with you the science behind it and why I do it and the results that it has created in my life. And I'm going to give you a free template to use so that you can try it out too, so that you can think and be more deliberate about what you're doing. That's the entire point of this, because the morning routine's only going to work if you make it yours. If you are a shift worker and your morning routine begins at midnight, all of these same principles apply. You need to make them work for you, otherwise you're not going to do it. And I'm the kind of person that if something sounds too good to be true, I tend to just sort of get like cynical about things and go, I'm not trying that, that's a gimmick. If I understand the science behind it, which is why I explain the science behind why you should never hit the snooze alarm when you need to get up and get going. Um, when I understand the science and the reason and the research behind something, I am convinced to try it. And when I see results in my own life, uh, then I keep doing it. And so again, today the training is very simple. You're going to continue being deliberate about building a morning routine. Tonight, plug the phone in outside your bedroom. Tomorrow morning when the alarm goes off, you are going to wake up as soon as that alarm gets off. You're welcome to hate me for that. That's fine. Five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. If you're using your phone for the alarm, walk across the room, turn off the alarm. Do not pick up your phone. Do not. Go to a different part of the room. Go to the kitchen. Go to the bathroom. Go to your office. Go somewhere else. Crack open your notebook. The first 10 to 30 minutes are for you, are for you. If you've got kids that get up really early, wake up 15 minutes earlier than you normally do so you've got that quiet time in the house for you. In the email that goes out later today, I'm going to put in the email the link to the PDF of the 5 Second Journal template. You can also get that at 5secondjournal.com. If um, for some reason you're not on the email list, get to melrobbins.com slash mindset reset so we can get these things to you. And in tomorrow's post, we'll be sure to upload a link to the PDF so that you can reach it as well.
I want to answer a few questions. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to break down the journaling method, which is why I want you to have it in front of you tomorrow morning when you wake up so you can try it so that the training goes along with it. I also want to preview something. Many of you have been asking about whether or not we're going to get into anxiety. You better believe it. Now that our trainings have covered default, the default network in your brain, how to become a deliberate thinker, thinking this, not that, learning how to spot your limiting beliefs and switching gears and choosing what you think about. We're now in the middle of building a habit in the morning that's going to help support you be a deliberate thinker and will also give you control first thing in the morning so that you are in control of what you're thinking about. You've planned your day. You've pushed your dreams forward. That's going to start you out in a totally different way. Then we're going to get into topics like anxiety, depression, how to talk to your kids about anxiety. These are issues and um, mental health challenges that you face when your limiting beliefs, your worries, and your stress become not only your default, but they start to spin out of control and become the constant way that you think, not just the default that gets triggered. So we're going to be covering all of that in the coming weeks. This is game-changing stuff, but we got to start with the foundational stuff first. Default versus deliberate thinking, thinking this, not that, spotting your limiting beliefs and realizing it's a habit the way that you think that way. It's not the truth. And now building a morning routine so that the way that you wake up, how you wake up and how you spend those first couple minutes of the day support your mindset changing and give you control through the rest of the day. Before I preview what we're going to talk about tomorrow, let me jump um, into some of the questions uh, that we've gotten. If you've got questions, just put them right down there. Um, tell me, did you take the phone challenge? Did you take the snooze alarm challenge? Did you hate it? Did you? What did you notice? Share with us what's going on because by you sharing your story, you're going to be inspiring other people as well. Even if you failed, so what? You're trying something new. Failing is just as good as succeeding at something because you're learning something. And Guess what? Tomorrow morning when that alarm rings, you get to go for it again. So shout out to Edith Shaw on Facebook. I wasn't sure if I could actually go to sleep knowing my phone was in another room, but I did. I turned it to silent and went to sleep. It was weird to say the least, and I did find myself reaching for it in the middle of the night only to find it wasn't there. Did you do that too? I know. It's a really crazy habit to break because you don't realize how addicted you are. But here's the good news. This is what Edith noticed. I really noticed the difference. I had space in my mind to think about my day. I visualized for a few moments. I thought about how my day will unfold. I wrote in my planner and all felt a lot more peaceful and calm. Deirdre, she accepted the challenge last night, which actually had her get out of bed to cut off the foam alarm. Then she put the phone back down until I was ready to check the news. I was so much more productive and awake before leaving my house to get to the gym. I will do this every day now. I am hammering this stuff because it works. Here's a few more. Amy Robbins on Facebook. You mentioned if you wake up before the alarm, you need to get up. I often wake up early, but don't want to get up yet. Am I out of luck and just need to get out of bed? Amy, look, you got to make this work for you. So if you wake up before the alarm and you have a meditation practice where you lie in your bed and you meditate and it works for you, do it. Then get up. What I don't want you to do, Amy, is drift back to sleep because drifting back to sleep causes your brain to go into another sleep cycle, which lasts 75 to 90 minutes. And if you wake up before the 75 to 90 minutes, you've put your brain in a state of sleep inertia, and that's going to impact your productivity for the next four hours and your focus for the next four hours. That's why I don't want you drifting back to sleep. I could never lie in bed. I'm not that kind of person because I will fall back asleep. I hate getting up. But if it works for you as part of your mindfulness routine, your morning practice to the, wake up before the alarm, have a mindfulness practice, and then five, four, three, two, one, get up, don't look at your phone, take the first 10 to 30 minutes for yourself, fantastic, go for it. Make it your own. That way you'll actually do it. Jane Harmon uh, McFarlane on Facebook, I start work at 6 a.m. every day and the alarm is set for 5.50. Do you suggest that I wake up earlier or can I do dream goal time before bed? I really want you to do it when you wake up. I would wake up earlier, Jane. I would wake up at 5.30 and here's why. Um, the reason why is I when you wake up, you got a clean slate. 
what I would love for you to deliberately put into your prefrontal cortex, the executive center of your brain, is I would like you to deliberately put how you want your day to go, what's the one thing that matters to you, and one thing that you can do to advance your dreams. Why? If you go back to some of the earlier trainings when we talk about the two modes of the brain and the fact that we all have a default, default mode network that acts like a filtering system in our minds. Part of the reason why I want you to wake up and engage the executive center of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, and be deliberate about what you're thinking is that by doing that, we are reprogramming your default network. We are telling the default network in your brain, the fabric and filter system in your brain, what you care about and what we want help spotting opportunities around. You know how there are moments in your life where you feel like you're in a state of flow and you notice these magical coincidences and you spot all kinds of interesting connections and things just seem to happen. Part of the reason why that happens or the law of attraction works is because by getting deliberate about what you're thinking about and about what you care about, you are priming your mind to be programmed to see connections and opportunities. Visualization, the law of attraction, it's not just some woo-woo garbage. There's hard science that explains why it works and it has to do with your default um, uh, mode in your, in your brain and how when you get deliberate and you engage the executive center in your brain, your prefrontal cortex, you train your brain to help you spot opportunities. Finally, last question, Mikey on Instagram, why do I feel so guilty for carving out personal time? It's been hard for me since becoming a parent. I'll tell you why, Mikey. I bet it has to do with your limiting belief. I bet it has to do with that negative thing that you default to, whether you think you're not worthy or you think you're not good enough, that somewhere deep down inside, by taking time out for yourself, you are saying to yourself, well, I, d I don't deserve to do that. And the only way that you're going to start to carve out personal time is if you go to war against that limiting belief and you create a new one. And the new one around personal time is I will be a better parent, a better father, a better husband if I take time and go to the gym. I will be a better parent, a better person, a better husband if I take time to work on my dreams. And by the way, you want your kids to know how to take care of themselves, right? Well, the only way they're going to learn it is if you model it. So if you can't do it for yourself, use modeling, having healthy boundaries and healthy habits as an individual, modeling it for your kids as your motivation. All right, I got to hop because there are 1,500 people in a ballroom downstairs that I need to give a speech to. <laughs> Um, but tomorrow we are going to add on to this mindset training and the connection with your morning routine and we're going to get personal. You're going to have a copy of my method and the journaling that I do every morning to prime my mind based on science. I'm going to walk you through step by step each one of the steps. I want you to try them. I want you to tweak them and make them your own. And I want you to continue to fight for that 10 to 30 minutes every morning. Here's the recap on your homework. Tonight, you're going to plug in your phone. Outside of your bedroom, you're going to go to bed. When the alarm rings, you're going to get up. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, no snooze. You're going to turn off the alarm if it's on your phone. And tomorrow morning, you're going to take 10 to 30 minutes all for you. You can meditate. You can plan your day. You can print out the PDF we're going to mail you in a little bit. That's the uh, journaling page from the five second journal, my journaling method. You can fill that out and see how that feels. But you're going to practice grabbing your attention and being deliberate and setting your day up to go in the direction you want it to go in. And something's going to surprise you when you do that. You're going to be training your mind to help you make your day go in the direction that you want it to go. And you're going to start noticing all kinds of connections and, and magical things that happen. I know it sounds really weird, but it's true. This is the beauty of what happens when you get deliberate about what you want to see in the world. You get deliberate about what you want to say to yourself. And as always, continue to spot those limiting beliefs when they rise up today. And the second you see yourself saying, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, 
Why did I say something so stupid? Uh, now's not a good time. I better not say what I really feel. You're going to interrupt that old default and you're going to insert something that's positive because that is the work of doing a mindset reset. It's not a one and done. It's something you do all day long because you are fighting against a lifetime of limiting beliefs. All right. Um, what else was I going to say? In case nobody else tells you today, I want to be the one to tell you that I love you. And I believe in your ability to make your life better. I believe in your ability to be happier. I believe in your ability to pursue your dreams. And that's why I'm here every day to remind you of that fact and that you got this. Here's a couple concepts that I want you to think about. First, we're going to talk about globally how I want you to think about being able to focus your attention and get things done. Okay. And this is on a day to day basis. First of all, when I talk about productivity and the ability to focus your attention on a day to day basis, I want you to understand a simple fact. In order to get things done, in order to direct your focus and move through a task, you are going to require some brain power. And so I want you to think about your brain like a, a car engine, right? And a car engine is what you need uh, in a car to power you forward. And your brain is like an engine that will power you forward to help you get tasks done. Now, an engine requires fuel, right? And sure enough, your brain has a certain amount of fuel. So imagine that you got like a tank that has fuel in it, in your brain, okay? And as you wake up and as you go through your day and as you direct your attention on things, guess what happens to that fuel in your brain? It starts to drain. And so I want you to know this because the tactics and the tools that I'm about to teach you relate to the fuel in your brain and what times of day you have the most fuel, what times of day you are more likely to be able to focus, okay? And what do you think, everybody, is the best time of day for your brain and for the amount of fuel that you have in your brain naturally? in order to be able to tap into it and drive your focus at something that's important to you. I love this. You guys are right. Laura says my brain is mush by the end of the day. Everybody's saying morning, morning, morning. I see somebody saying I feel like I'm on empty. This is a really good analogy because there are times where you feel like your brain is full of gas and you're able to direct your attention and focus. And then there are times where you're like, Jesus, I feel like I'm running on empty. I'm running on fumes here. And you're absolutely right, everybody. It is mornings. When you wake up, generally what the research shows is that your brain is primed to be able to focus for the first four hours of the day. The first four hours of the day tend to be for most of us the time of day when your brain has the most fuel and when your speed of processing is awesome and when you are able to direct your attention at what you need to be focused on okay so now there's a caveat to this you can manufacture boosts of productivity and boosts of feeling like you've got a little bit more brain power Number one, immediately after you exercise. So if you have a burst of cardio, 30 minutes is what a lot of the research says. But if you have a burst of cardio, you will get a little bit of increase in fuel. Another thing that helps is getting outside. Getting outside uh, when you start to feel your energy and your focus start to go to empty, getting outside is another way to give yourself a boost of brain power. But generally speaking, everybody, you need to start to marry mornings with peak productivity, okay? This is true for most of us. There will be some of you that are like, I don't know what you're talking about, Mel Robbins, because I feel like my brain is full at the end of the day. If that's you, because I see some of you going, well, that's nighttime for me. 
you got to run with that and you got to save the most important stuff for those moments where naturally you feel like you've got the energy and you got the fuel in the tank to be able to focus. So kind of like, you know, you think, what do you think of when I say the word salt? You think of pepper. What do you say? What do you think of when I say the word peanut butter? You probably think of jelly. When I say the word productivity and focus, for most of us, I want you to start thinking morning. And here's why that's important. The reason why that's important is because if you can own your mornings, if you can put that thing that matters to you first thing in the morning and make a little bit of progress on it, you are going to start to feel like you are more in control. You're going to start to see yourself using your best brain power and your highest level of fuel at the thing that matters most to you. So that's a little tip for you about productivity. Try to attack the thing that matters to you first thing in the morning, before you jump on your phone, before you answer emails, before you start attacking a to-do list that's full of shit you don't really care about, before you look at social media. Direct your brain when your fuel level is high and your focus is clear at the thing that matters to you. <clears throat> and it's not just because it makes sense that you would want to do this. I mean, the second you look at email, your stress level goes through the roof, your attention gets hijacked. But it's also because based on research, literally, your, your margin for error increases. You know, they did this research with anesthesiologists. And do you know that the number of errors increase as the day goes on? The number of errors that we see in hospitals increase almost three times from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., hand washing decreases in hospitals. And that also relates to problems in the day. Now look, the margin of error is very small. But what happens as you go through your day, particularly if you're not getting outside to increase the fuel in your brain and kind of reset your ability to focus, particularly if you're not introducing cardio, which also uh, increases the fuel in the brain and helps you focus, is that your ability to maintain concentration as your fuel level decreases and your brain power decreases and the distractions increase and the number of things that you're trying to remember increase, your ability to laser focus decreases. That's why, that's why mornings matter everybody when it comes to focus and when it comes to human error, when it comes to distraction, this isn't just research, this is common sense. And you know, this is not to slight anybody that is working in a hospital because those folks are angels, particularly after this pandemic and the margin of error is puny. But when we look at even a puny margin of error over the course of, of a day and of the decrease in brain power and the increase in information that your brain is absorbing, geez Louise, it does increase 3X. So you want to prioritize what's important to you first thing in the morning. And you know how I feel about the phone, everybody. Do not look at that damn thing until you have literally figured out what matters to you and you've made a little bit of progress. I am a productivity consultant. I've had a challenge with people. They know what they need to do, and this is my challenge as well. I know what I need to do. I know what needs to be done. Right. But getting that motivation and getting over that ledge and that five second rule, my goodness, changed my life. Things like doing my finances. I hate doing my finances. So I would five, four, three, two, one it, and next thing I knew, I was in QuickBooks. Awesome. And it started with little things. I haven't quite made it to not hitting snooze yet. Okay. <laughs> Why? Oh, because my bed feels so comfy in the morning. Let me tell you something. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Your business will go to the next level the second you actually beat the habit of hitting the snooze. Yes. And the reason why is because of the science around productivity mm -hmm. and the brain. Okay. And when you push yourself to walk the talk and have the first 30 minutes of your day mm -hmm. be the most productive for your brain, you will bring a level of conviction and authority and impact to the business that's not there currently. Right. You see, when you're uh, an expert 
and you're a consultant, your power is limited mm -hmm. to the extent that you personally feel like you're not using the tools. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I say this for myself. I say this because when I think about businesses that I've had in the past or when I was an executive coach and I would be giving advice but I'm not technically following it in the same regard, mm -hmm. I'm not as powerful. Right. And so I would highly, highly, highly encourage you, starting tomorrow morning, you wanna be the best productivity coach on the planet? That alarm goes off, notice the gap. Right. Because the more that you start to play with this five second window and you go five, four, three, two, one and you push yourself out of bed and you hate it. And then you take your cold shower uh -huh. and you hate it. <laughs> and then you don't look at your phone and you hate it. Yeah. And then you spend the first 30 minutes of the day pushing something forward and you hate it. Mm -hmm but you do it, you will now be able to coach people who do the exact same thing. Right, and that's where I'm coming from in a lot of my business is I've been there, I'm the one I'm one who likes to pile things and procrastinate, yep. but I know a lot of tips and tricks to get you out of those modes and that's how I help my clients. I'm also trying to move more into productivity. I'm a, I say I'm a professional organizer and productivity consultant and I organize your space, your time, and your technology. Great. Which is a little bit different from most organizers because they're only focusing on their space or the time. Right. And not the technology. So you can organize somebody's computer, somebody's workspace, mm -hmm. and somebody's home. Yep. That you can do and still snooze. Yes. <laughs> you want to be successful and actually shift people's productivity, mm -hmm. you got to do it for yourself right. first. Right. That and so sense. call BS on yourself mm -hmm. and understand that, like, here's two years from now, how much money you want to be making? Oh. Like, no joke, is yeah. a productivity, how much money you want to be making? I want to be making at least 100000 a year. Fantastic. Yeah. How are you going to feel? Empowered. Yes, <laughs> you're gonna feel so empowered. Yes. I want you to think for a second about those zeros mm -hmm. on that statement when you file your taxes yeah. about what you took in. Yeah. Now, tomorrow morning, when that alarm goes off and you start feeling all the excuses that come in and that bed is cozy, I know what you're saying, <laughs> I love my bed too. And you then go five, four, three, two, one and you get up I want you to be thinking about that $100,000. Okay. I want you to be thinking about how proud you are of yourself. And I want you to be thinking about how good it feels to demonstrate and walk the talk in terms of what you're actually coaching other people right. to do. And if you do that and you show up every day and you think about that $100,000 and you think about what it's gonna be like in two years when you have turned this corner, uh -huh you will get out of bed. Mm -hmm. This is the corner for you. Yes. Okay? Yep. And the, uh, the piece of advice that I gave you is anchored in a lot of science. Uh -huh. So when people think about their future selves, they did this experiment where they had um, two control groups decide to put away money in like a 401k mm -hmm. from their paycheck. And before one group did it, they showed them a digitized um, photograph of themselves 20 years older, uh -huh. they put in more money because they were thinking about their future self. That makes sense. Yeah. The people who were not shown that put in the average amount. Yeah. These people put in a significant amount of money without even being asked to because they were thinking about their future right. self. I want you to think about that future self every single morning and then I want you to use the five second rule to close the gap between the habit you have now and the person you want to become. I love it. Have you ever heard of slithering out of bed. Holy cow, I'm Mel Robbins. I'm so excited to teach this to you. It will change your life, okay? If you struggle with anxiety, with depression, if you have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, slithering is something I want you to try. It is a form of somatic therapy and it's gonna change your life. It changed mine. I've been doing it for six weeks. And in fact, I wanted to make this video because I posted this video about it just a short one the other day, and it exploded online. You had so many questions, so I wanted to dive deeper. So let me demonstrate. So when you wake up, oh, and you feel that heaviness, what I would do is the first thing I would do is I would high five my heart, which I taught you in the high five habit. I'd put a hand here and a hand here, and i just say, I'm okay, I'm safe. I'm loved. And that 
hand right here and right here, it just really grounds me and it tones the vagus nerve, which helps to flip from a state of fight or flight, dread, fleeing into a calmer place. And then I think about the fact that I'm about to slither out of this bed. I don't want to slither out of this bed. I don't feel ready to slither out of this bed. This is not something that makes me happy. This is not something that I want to do. Slithering out of bed in a moment where I'm depressed or grieving or anxious because I know that I'll feel better once I get moving, slithering out of bed is what I need to do. And so there would be mornings that I would use the five second rule to initiate it. So you can count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. You're under your covers, five, four, three, two, one. And then, I mean, you literally move in this bit, the direction of the floor. You just succumb to the resistance and then you're gonna move around. And, you know, there would be mornings, honestly, in the past six weeks that I would get to this point and I'd want to crawl in a fetal position like this and I'd lay there for a minute and then the dog would come over and lick me and then I'd move like this. And then the more that I did it, the less I would lay on the ground. I'd just kind of roll around and stretch. And then eventually when you're ready, whatever shape you want, because it's the resistance that you're feeling, you get on all fours and you just start to crawl. And you're staying low to the ground because you're giving in to the heaviness, but you're not throwing in the towel. You're moving with it. You're moving through it. And at some point as you're crawling, you will feel ready to just stand up. And it's almost like that sort of physical moving moves all that resistance out of you and through you in a way that is organic, it's doable. It feels like in a weird way, it sort of acknowledges and honors the depression and the grief or anxiety or sadness or overwhelm that you're feeling. And it's super empowering because you don't have to feel energized or motivated. And there's a lot of mornings where I don't. And knowing that I can use this technique to embody and move with the heaviness inside me as a way to move through it and get my power back, it's, it's absolutely incredible. So I want you to try it. I want you to try slithering. I'm gonna answer some of your questions because you guys blew up my DMs and my comments when I posted that video. Um, how long have you been practicing the slither and why did you start? Well, I've been practicing for six weeks and I started because my therapist recommended it as a way to um, not, as a way to feel empowered uh, while I was facing so many changes in my life that felt too big to bear. That even though life is overwhelming, you still have power inside you to move through the things that are scaring the hell out of you right now. And sometimes you don't have to muster up a ton of strength. Sometimes all you gotta do is slither, seriously. Um, when would I use this technique? Well, you would use this technique, I think any moment where it's just too much to bear. Like I kept saying to my therapist, intellectually, I know that I need to get up. Intellectually, I know that this kind of period from 5.30 a.m. until 10.30 a.m. that it's gonna, get better with time. But physically, I can't push through it. And I'm starting to get scared of it. And so that's when she said, I think you need to lean into it. I think you need to take an embodied approach. And so I think anytime you feel that way, whether you're on the couch or maybe for you, it's not getting up in the morning. Maybe you spend so much time at night kind of unwinding from the day that you have a really hard time getting from the couch to your bed. So maybe for you, it's like an end of the day transition from one place that you're sunk into, uh, into your bedroom. Um, have I noticed a difference? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
I've noticed a huge difference because I now have another tool in my toolbox. I mean, I've been using the five second rule for 14 years to five, four, three, two, one, push myself out of bed, force myself out of bed. This feels like something gentle and uh, just powerful in its own way. And I love having two different things I can do. What if I have a dog who will jump all over me? It's actually great because the dog like is worried about you because the dog can sense all that heaviness in you. And the dog also will probably bring some playful energy, which is probably gonna make it fat easier and faster for you to stand up because their energy will transfer to you. Um, what if my bed is high up or I have a wood floor or I sleep and I don't have the mobility to fall out of bed? That's a great question. I, if you have a high bed, roll the foot out first and then you can kind of like slide down, you know, like that and do that. I think if you sleep on the floor, maybe just roll around on the floor. Right? So if you're, you know, on a, a, a futon on the floor, or you sleep on a thermorest or whatever, just roll off the thermorest or roll away from where you are so that you get kind of moving. Um, that's a, probably a great way to start. And so whatever the slither or the slide or the embodiment of moving through the heaviness means to you, that's what you want to do. Um, let's see. Can you teach this technique? To your kids, yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's great for kids actually, because you're honoring how they feel. You're not trying to correct them or coerce them. You're actually creating a deeper connection with them because you're honoring that they don't wanna get out of bed. And so they, oh, it's a morning that you're gonna slither, you're gonna slide out of bed. So you can have fun with it. Um, what if you have a hard time feeling stuff in your body? I actually think this would help. Maybe it's hard to get out of bed because you are disconnected from your body. Like I was surprised. I was kind of scared to try this because if I already felt so scared in my body, it's going to sound weird, but if I already felt so scared in my body, hiding under the covers gave me a false sense of safety, right? I'm hiding from the world, even though I hate the feelings of my body. So there was something scary about like, allowing myself to slither out of that safe cocoon where I'm fighting from the world into the floor where you're open and, and all this stuff. And so I get that, but you've, I've been empowered by how quickly that heaviness that pinned me to the bed leaves as I roll and move and start crawling and walking. And you know, the more you do it, the more you'll notice the faster you go from like crawling to actually standing up. I do have the questions. Oh, we've got one more. Um, can I use somatic therapy in other areas of my life? Absolutely. Like I, 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 somatic therapy, I believe, is just using your body as a way to move through things, whether it's meditation or it's deep breathing, or I would imagine that the cold exposure therapy and the ice baths that I do are a form of somatic therapy yoga, um, uh, regardless of what form you practice, Tai Chi, even going outside, hiking, spending time in nature, deeper breathing. Those are all forms of somatic therapy that we all need to integrate more into our day-to-day -day life. Number one, work ethic. I'll outwork anybody. Um, I know that the secret to success is not getting it right. It's actually uh, getting after it until you get it done. And um, so work ethic, work ethic, work ethic. Anything is possible if you are willing to give up your timeline and you're willing to put your head down and put the work in. The second thing is um, I know that failure and screw ups are a massive uh, part of paving the road to success. Like, you know, I'm not a lucky person that can just study stuff and implement it and then it all works out. I have this deeply personal process that everybody shares, by the way, of studying everybody who does it really well and then implementing their best practices and then tweaking it so that it feels right. And so failure, screw ups, detours, all of it uh, is part of the road to success. The third thing is, and you know, I write about actually all of this stuff in the high five habit. 
there is this mindset trick that I created that is an entire chapter in the high five habit that I created when I was um, launching the five second rule book, which uh, the hardcover book was a huge failure, believe it or not. And um, when we launched the hardcover, uh, it originally uh, we had the bottom line is, is that when I launched the hardcover, Evan, the hardcover was not available for sale when my marketing kicked off. Like there was a screw up with Amazon. I started marketing. I told everybody to go buy it. And it read as out of stock. Couldn't even pre-order it. It was like out of stock. Huge mix up on my part. I was a self-published author. And as my attitude was going down the drain, I literally started saying this thing to myself on repeat. And everybody, you should just steal this. Um, It's like chapter 13 in the book. This moment is preparing me. This moment is preparing me. This moment is preparing me for something amazing that hasn't happened yet. And every single thing in my life that has been a struggle or a hardship or a heartbreak or anything, even losing people I love to the disease of hopelessness and addiction, Those moments of going through tremendous grief and heartache prepared me to help other people to do it. And so when you can start to ground yourself in this idea that I never really liked, by the way, Evan, that whole phrase, life is happening for me, because there's a lot of that I didn't I don't want it. I don't believe it's for me. But there's something about tweaking it like this is preparing me. It allows me to take control of a situation I don't like, I didn't want, I didn't plan for, it's not what I deserve. But if it's preparing me for something, it flips my mindset into this attitude that allows me to endure it and allows me to have perspective that someday I will look back on it and understand the wisdom that I gained from it. And so, you know, the failure of the hardcover with the five second rule prepared me for something all right. It introduced me to my business model that has a huge partnership with Audible. Like the five second rule because of the failure of the hardcover became the most sold and listened to audiobook of the year of all of 2017 and opened up a whole new business model. And, you know, which by the way is still bearing out everybody because as the book sells out around the world, It's the audiobook. Like we were the number one selling audiobook in the world last week. Number two selling title on Amazon because of the audiobook. And so there's a whole new business model I learned. And so you need to understand that every failure that you have, everybody, it is actually preparing you for something else. That's number three, that sort of attitude. Um, The other thing, honestly is I've been successful in spite of myself, Evan, because it's only since learning the high five habit that I have been able to truly reset my default thinking and become a person whose default is to cheer for herself. Do I have insecurities? Yes. Do I have self-doubts? Yes. But the one thing I don't do anymore is I do not beat the hell out of myself anymore. You see, even all those years, everybody, when uh, my speaking career was taking off, I was literally my biggest critic. It was never enough. It was, well, I kind of, you know, even though the audience is giving me a standing ovation and the clients just hired me to do seven more events, Evan, I'm like, well, God, I really screwed up minute 43. I really blew it that time. Like I was relentless with myself. And there's a difference, everybody, between having a level of excellence in what you do and high standards, which I know Evan has a level of excellence in what he does. And he also marries his process with excellence. But that's very different than relentless self-criticism. You know what I mean? And and what happens with relentless self-criticism, self-hatred, self-doubt, all of that beatdown is that, number one, you slow down your progress. Number two, you miss opportunities. Number three, 
you uh, lose inspiration and motivation because everything is a grind. Number four, you have no joy in what you're doing because you are singularly focused on finding stuff that's not going right. And number five, you literally will never be happy and content because you're not allowing yourself to celebrate and empower yourself for all the things you're doing right, which only creates more positive momentum. And it was the high five habit, something I created by mistake in April of 2020 that completely changed my habits, my attitude. The reason why this is the most successful thing I've ever done is because I'm different. Uh, using the high five habit, I've asked for help. I've, I've gotten out of the insecurity of needing to do it all myself. I'm enjoying the process of it, even though it's kind of a show behind the scenes. Like this is um, just the greatest gift in the world because it changes how I experience my life. And that's the biggest thing, everybody. That's the final takeaway in terms of success and why most of you don't have the success you deserve because you're too hard on yourself. You are focused on what's not working instead of celebrating what is. You're beating the hell out of yourself every day, which is demotivating. If you want to be more successful than you could ever imagine, you must read the high five habit. You must start to put these practices in place. You must start to see the good. You must start to flip your attitude when it's going down. And you must, must, must be able to use the tools in here to become somebody that is supportive, encouraging of yourself. I love it. And, and just to speak to your willingness to ask for help, as well as the, just the work ethic, uh, back in Napa, w one of our field trips was to go hot air ballooning. And uh, you and I are both afraid of heights. <laughs> it's like, okay, I we're in the, we're in the same balloon together. And it was like a half hour, 45 minute ride to get there. And, and Mel's sitting next to me and uh, we're in this little van and she pulls out her notebook. He's like, okay, Evan, tell me everything that's wrong with my YouTube channel. I, I don't have the answers, but I'm going to take notes. I'm going to make sure that this happens. So be honest and tell me, you're like, rip it apart. It's like, okay. <laughs> and we did a jam session all the way up. And so I love how you, you know, are constantly trying to learn and maximize the time. And even if it's something that is, you know, you're not going to be the one updating thumbnails and tweaking titles. And even though you don't I fully understand it. We were today. There we go. I love yep. it. Yep. But no, I, I think that's it too, Evan. And you're like this. Thank you for the comment. You're the exact same. That's why you see it in me. We are both learners. Like, I think this is the greatest thing in the world, everybody, to like, of course, I want to update thumbnails and, and, and obsess over titles because that's the art of this. And unless you're willing to be a student of what you're doing, you'll never be able to teach the things that you've learned. And so, you know, I think that, you know, Evan is such a student of his craft. It's why he has so much success and he's having a lot of fun because he brings a student mindset to what he's doing. What's the one thing that you want to make progress on that you want to find some time to be productive on? Because productivity, everybody, true productivity is not plowing through a to-do list on shit that doesn't matter. True productivity is making progress on something that matters to you because that's going to make you feel like you own your life again. That's going to make you feel like you're putting yourself first. And these projects, everybody, you don't have to get them done this weekend. You just need to identify, make a plan for what's the most important thing. I want to get my sister's SSI paperwork completed for her. I would love to spend more time with my son. I would love to work on my YouTube channel. Amazing, amazing, everybody. I would love to remember to high five myself in the morning I see somebody. I'd love to spend time on my job search. Right now, all we're doing in order to have a breakthrough in productivity, step number one is to identify one thing that you want to make progress on by the end of the week. That's it. Could be today, could be this weekend. Just identify the one thing you want to make progress on that matters to you that you never seem to have time on. For me, I really want to spend time with my son. And what does that mean? That means I got to be intentional about carving out time to be with him. And so we're going to go skiing together this weekend in Vermont. And I 
have to take the step to organize the time because just going up and being with him for the weekend, that isn't going to lead to quality time together, right? It's going to leave me in his presence and him in my presence, but he'll probably want to spend time with his friends. He'll probably want to spend time with his girlfriend. I'll be busy doing other things. And so you really need to identify what is it that matters to you that you want to prioritize and make progress on. That's step number one, everybody. Um, because if you don't actually make a game plan, it's sort of like a football team that's playing and they score in the wrong end zone. You need to know what is it that matters to you because you can be busy as hell, you can be productive as hell on all the wrong shit and then literally it's like scoring in the wrong end zone because you were not focused on the goal that mattered to you. Okay, great. So I see so many people writing down what they want and I also see people going, I'm so bad at organizing my time. No, you're not. You're terrible at figuring out and identifying what matters to you. Because the fact is, everybody, based on research, if you end every week feeling like you made progress on one thing, just one thing that matters, and notice I said progress, not that you got it done, that you just spent some time and you just pushed yourself forward a little bit. If you, based on the research, end every week going, wow, I made a little bit of progress on something that mattered to me, the book I want to write, the YouTube channel I'm trying to start, the job search I'd like to do, researching trauma patterns in relationships so that I can show up better in my relationships, uh, finding a therapist, spending time doing that. Whatever it is that is the most important project for you personally, identify. Step number one. Number two, focus on progress. So part of the reason why you don't feel productive is because you're trying to complete everything. And so let's take one of the things that I saw somebody write, that you want to uh, clean up one of the spare rooms in your apartment or in your house, that maybe there's a spare bedroom and you have been wanting to turn it into a home office, or maybe one of the kids has moved out of the house and you want to declutter that room, like in a project around organizing. Maybe it's something in your garage or your basement. Or, hey, here's one for me. Uh, our daughter moved out and started her life, uh, you know, post-college. And our other daughter is uh, out in Los Angeles going to college. And we, no joke, have three garbage bags full of clothes that somebody needs to go through to figure out what needs to be donated, what could you actually sell because it still has tags on it. And it has been sitting there for two months. So maybe you have a pile of that kind of stuff in your house. This is not a priority for me. I'm perfectly fine with it sitting in the room where our laundry is. The priority for me this week is to carve out dedicated time to hang out with our 16 year old son and do something fun together. Because we spend a lot of time together but we don't get intentional about doing something specific. But if you want to declutter, for example, here's where we all go wrong. You identify what you want to do, and then you think you got to get it done. In order for me to go through two bags of clothing, for example, in order for you to clear out your garage, that could take you two days to do it the right way, right? Because you know, if you don't give yourself enough time, then you're going to piles, and so then you think, I can't get it done, and so then you never schedule it, right? Okay. We're not going to worry about completion, everybody. We're going to worry about progress. So when you think about things in terms of progress, it can shrink the amount of time that you need. Maybe all that you're going to do is you're going to work on one dresser in the room, or you're going to work on one shelving unit in the garage. And by simply making the time to, number one, identify what matters to you, and number two, identify what meaningful progress could look like. You will now shrink the amount of time, you will define the project, and you can make the time for it. And simply just doing that is going to make you feel more productive based on the research. All right, now let me talk about um, what you need to do. Okay, I literally have notes for this. Oh, there we go. And I just lost it because I really want to make sure that I teach you all this stuff. So, um, here, Becca, can you help me? Because this is not, oh, because my thing is not, never mind. Guys, I am, I am trying, multitasking is not how you be productive. And you are watching me multitask right now. We're going to get into some of the science now. 
So now that is how you leverage something called the progress principle. Okay, the progress principle is really important when it comes to productivity. This is a concept that I first learned about in the Harvard Business Review. So if it's in the Harvard Business Review, everybody, very fancy, must be accurate, right? If it's coming from Harvard. Well, the progress principle is a study that uh, comes from a study where researchers looked at, I believe it was 14,000 work journals. And what they found after looking at the work journals of how people spent their time, 14,000 people, is that at the end of the week, the people that felt like they had been the most productive and the people who felt the most fulfilled by their work week were the people who simply made progress on something that mattered. And so by you identifying what matters to you this week and by you identifying a way that you can make a small amount of progress on it, you are leveraging this research from Harvard Business Review about what creates productivity and meaning and fulfillment in your life. And that's making progress on something that matters. Now that I've introduced you to the progress principle, I want to unpack some of the science around productivity, okay? So that you can also bring what research says about what productive people do to leverage brain power to be more productive. Ready? Everybody ready? Okay, good. So Here's a couple concepts that I want you to think about. First, we're going to talk about globally how I want you to think about being able to focus your attention and get things done. Okay. And this is on a day to day basis. First of all, when I talk about productivity and the ability to focus your attention on a day to day basis, I want you to understand a simple fact. In order to get things done, in order to direct your focus and move through a task, you are going to require some brain power. And so I want you to think about your brain like a, a car engine, right? And a car engine is what you need uh, in a car to power you forward. And your brain is like an engine that will power you forward to help you get tasks done. Now, an engine requires fuel, right? And sure enough, your brain has a certain amount of fuel. So imagine that you got like a tank that has fuel in it, in your brain, okay? And as you wake up and as you go through your day and as you direct your attention on things, guess what happens to that fuel in your brain? It starts to drain. And so I want you to know this because the tactics and the tools that I'm about to teach you relate to the fuel in your brain and what times of day you have the most fuel, what times of day you are more likely to be able to focus. Okay. And what do you think everybody is the best time of day for your brain and for the amount of fuel that you have in your brain naturally in order to be able to tap into it and drive your focus at something that's important to you. I love this. You guys are right. Laura says my brain is mush by the end of the day. Everybody's saying morning, morning, morning. I see somebody saying I feel like I'm on empty. This is a really good analogy because there are times where you feel like your brain is full of gas and you're able to direct your attention and focus. And then there are times where you're like, Jesus, I feel like I'm running on empty. I'm running on fumes here. And you're absolutely right, everybody. It is mornings. When you wake up, generally what the research shows is that your brain is primed to be able to focus for the first four hours of the day. The first four hours of the day tend to be, for most of us, the time of day when your brain has the most fuel and when your speed of processing is awesome and when you are able to direct your attention at what you need to be focused on. Okay. So now there's a caveat to this. You can manufacture boosts of productivity and boosts of feeling like you've got a little bit more brain power 
Number one, immediately after you exercise. So if you have a burst of cardio, 30 minutes is what a lot of the research says. But if you have a burst of cardio, you will get a little bit of increase in fuel. Another thing that helps is getting outside. Getting outside, uh, when you start to feel your energy and your focus start to go to empty, getting outside is another way to give yourself a boost of brain power. But generally speaking, everybody, you need to start to marry mornings with peak productivity, okay? This is true for most of us. There will be some of you that are like, I don't know what you're talking about, Mel Robbins, because I feel like my brain is full at the end of the day. If that's you, because I see some of you going, well, that's nighttime for me. You got to run with that and you got to save the most important stuff for those moments where naturally you feel like you've got the energy and you got the fuel in the tank to be able to focus. So kind of like, you know, you think, what do you think of when I say the word salt? You think of pepper. What do you say? What do you think of when I say the word peanut butter? You probably think of jelly. When I say the word productivity and focus, for most of us, I want you to start thinking morning. And here's why that's important. The reason why that's important is because if you can own your mornings, if you can put that thing that matters to you first thing in the morning and make a little bit of progress on it, you are going to start to feel like you are more in control. You're going to start to see yourself using your best brain power and your highest level of fuel at the thing that matters most to you. So that's a little tip for you about productivity. Try to attack the thing that matters to you first thing in the morning, before you jump on your phone, before you answer emails, before you start attacking a to-do list that's full of shit you don't really care about, before you look at social media. Direct your brain when your fuel level is high and your focus is clear at the thing that matters to you. <clears throat> and it's not just because it makes sense that you would want to do this. I mean, the second you look at email, your stress level goes through the roof, your attention gets hijacked. But it's also because based on research, literally, your, your margin for error increases. You know, they did this research with anesthesiologists and do you know that the number of errors increase as the day goes on? The number of errors that we see in hospitals increase almost three times from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., hand washing decreases in hospitals. And that also relates to problems in the day. Now look, the margin of error is very small. But what happens as you go through your day, particularly if you're not getting outside to increase the fuel in your brain and kind of reset your ability to focus, particularly if you're not introducing cardio, which also uh, increases the fuel in the brain and helps you focus, is that your ability to maintain concentration as your fuel level decreases and your brain power decreases and the distractions increase and the number of things that you're trying to remember increase, your ability to laser focus decreases. That's why, that's why mornings matter everybody when it comes to focus and when it comes to human error, when it comes to distraction, this isn't just research, this is common sense. And you know, this is not to slight anybody that is working in a hospital because those folks are angels, particularly after this pandemic and the margin of error is puny. But when we look at even a puny margin of error over the course of, of a day and of the decrease in brain power and the increase in information that your brain is absorbing, geez Louise, it does increase 3X. So you want to prioritize what's important to you first thing in the morning. And you know how I feel about the phone, everybody. Do not look at that damn thing until you have literally figured out what matters to you and you've made a little bit of progress. Now, to end, I want to give you two other really cool tips based on science uh, that is going to help you with something that is also a problem right now when it comes to productivity. I believe that right now, the single biggest barrier to you being able to focus on what matters to you is 
Zoom fatigue. Seriously, you are online all day. You're probably on video conference calls all day. Give me a heart or a hand in the comments, everybody. If you're like, I can't get work done because I'm always on freaking video conference calls all day, okay? I can't get anything done. I feel like I am a Zoom zombie at this point. How many of you feel like that? Like, holy smokes, I'm a Zoom zombie at this point. The number one thing that is zapping your ability to focus and to concentrate is video conference calls and being online all day. And let me tell you why. There are two reasons why this parade of Zoom meetings that you're on all day is killing your ability to focus on what's important. Number one, when you stare at a screen, your eyeballs, like if I'm staring at a screen, my eyeballs have to focus. Like they're literally focusing on something right in front of my face. And when you have to focus on something really in front of your face, it drains your mental fuel and it makes you feel tired. And so it is critical that you step away from the computer at least every 45 minutes, everybody. So every 45 minutes, what the research suggests is you need to step away from the computer or the phone or get off that Zoom conference and step outside, number one, even just open up a freaking window if you're in your apartment and look and like get the fresh air. And second thing you need to do is stare off into the horizon. Allow your eyeballs, like it's almost like they're twisted super tight when you have to focus something that's right here. When you step outside and you stare off at the horizon for just five minutes, it's like your eyeballs untwist, your brain relaxes, the fuel picks up a little bit, and that's a simple trick that's going to help you uh, with the fatigue that being online all day is causing. The second tip that's going to help you with focus, everybody, turn off your frigging camera. Sure, start the meeting, say hi to everybody, and then it is okay to say, hey, everybody, I'm going to turn off my camera because I, I, I really feel like I concentrate better. And here's the truth. The truth is you will concentrate better because if you stare at yourself on camera all day, this part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex engages, and it's hard for you to drift into kind of autopilot. If you and I are in a meeting, you're drifting in and out of paying attention because you are able to absorb information through all five senses. When you're in this two-dimensional space and you have to stare at your own face, this part of your brain engages and it drains fuel faster. That's one of the reasons why Zoom fatigue is real. Zoom fatigue is draining your focus because number one, your eyes are having to really focus. It's like they're twisting really tight because you're right close up. Number two, you're staring at yourself half the time, which makes this part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex, pay attention, and that drains your fuel faster. So the quick fix is turn off your camera. You are allowed to do that. You are adults here. Just tell people, I'm just going to turn off my camera because that way I notice I don't get a headache and I'm able to concentrate more. And every 45 minutes, step outside, take a deep breath, with the fresh air, let the nature make your senses come alive, and for five minutes, just stare off into the horizon. And here's one other final tip. It is perfectly acceptable, particularly in this hybrid environment, for you to take your calls, especially if you're able to turn your camera off, outside while you're walking. If you're moving while you're listening to a conference call, your fuel level is going to rise. Your heartbeat is going to go up. The outdoors is going to activate your senses. And it's a way for you to increase your focus and also be working. There you go. Three simple tips to combat Zoom fatigue, to increase the fuel and your ability to focus in your brain. All of this stuff is research back tools that uh, you can use immediately. You're getting the external success, but inside you are eating yourself up mm -hmm. with worry, right? Mm -hmm. Then we fast forward, let's say nine, 10 years. Uh -huh. 
April 2020, you are successful yeah. speaker, motivational coach, you know, best-selling uh, author, and you're struggling with self-doubt in front of the mirror. So is there this slight clash here somewhere where actually you can be successful and not love yourself and be racked with self-doubt? I think everybody is. Yeah. I don't, success is not the source of self-love. In fact, most people who are successful or competitive or entrepreneurs, most people are chasing that success because they have married their self-worth with achievement. Wait, wait. And I was the same. Yeah. And so <laughs> right there. Me too. And so this is, by the way, evidence that you have a problem with self-rejection yeah. and with self-worth and with self-criticism because you believe you are only worthy of love and you are only worthy of support if you have achieved the thing. So someone's looking at you and yes. thinking, man, I wish I was Mel Robbins, right? We'll, we'll talk about jealousy if we get to it later, but they might be jealous of you in a nice way. They might think, man, I wish I had a viral TED talk mm -hmm. like Mel. I mm -hmm. wish I had mm -hmm. multiple international bestsellers. Great, write them. Right? Great, apply for one. Yeah. You can do it. If I, if I can freaking do it, you can do it. But they might also be thinking, well, that is that is success. You've had that even though you were racked with these problems on the inside. Yeah. And they may think, you know what, I'll take that. I'll, I'll take that success. Um, and I think this comes to this wider societal point, which is we confuse sometimes success with happiness. When you anchor your happiness to doing things, it's yeah. always out of your control. When you anchor success to the crap you achieve, it is always a moving target. Yeah. And so, you know, I it's it's a really hard concept to wrap your brain around because first of all, there's the research that shows, at least in Western countries, that, you know, there's the baseline with money. 75 grand is the baseline that when somebody makes 75 grand or more, there's this happiness thing that I can't remember how the exact study goes, but it makes a lot of sense because as somebody who could not pay groceries with three kids, as somebody who had liens on her house, as somebody who was getting the bankruptcy letters in the mail, as somebody who was unemployed during this whole thing and whose husband was bouncing the payroll checks and was running from one restaurant to the other to hide from the collectors that were showing up, I know what it's like to live with the con constant, relentless pressure that comes from having no money. Yeah. And until you can get yourself to a state where you can take a deep breath and you can pay the bill yeah. and you can buy some groceries and you can put some gas in the car and the phone rings and it's not a collector, you are going to live a stressed out life because your basic needs are under threat. Yeah. And that is a horrendously triggering thing to live through. And we lived through it for several years. It was like that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, there is a certain level of economic stability that has a direct impact on your happiness, on your safety as a person, and your ability to experience less stress. So I just wanted to be, you know, responsible about that because I yeah. freaking lived it. And, um, but I do think that, you know, look, I use the five second rule. I certainly have found my calling. I love building stuff. I'm yeah. incredible as a businesswoman. I um, love the game of making money. I love being smart in deal making. I love content syndication. I'm super excited for NFTs and for how blockchain is going to change the role of being a creator. And so there's a part of this that's a real expression for me in terms of building a business. Yeah. And the five second rule helped me take action. And the five second rule made me very productive. And the five second rule had me go, no, I don't want to do a talk show. No, I don't want to do a talk show. No, I do not want to do a talk show. Why are we still talking? Like, I just, oh, and you know, this is interesting. When you say no, people want you more. I wish I knew that a long time ago. But so I for sure use the five second rule to push myself 
to take the actions that have made me wildly successful. But that doesn't change the fact that I would look in the mirror and yeah. still see a person that I didn't like. And that as soon as the five second rule book came out, like I'll, 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 I'll give you an example. So I write the high five habit book. I'm practicing these tools and I am also human. So when we get word two weeks before the book comes out, that the big box stores like Target and Walmart in the United States are passing on my book because I'm not a known author, I get triggered, I punch the wall, I pour a gin martini, light up a joint, I call a bunch of friends and bitch up a storm. <laughs> I am literally reliving being left out at a sleepover in middle school. I've got this gigantic, ridiculous story that, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm always left out. I'm never part of the group. Like there's this group of like real authors that are all friends that all permit, like, you know, I like have the <laughs> whole thing. I'm human. Put the record out, just press oh, play. Oh, yes, yes, exactly. I tend to be like angry, depressed kind of person, you know, like, yeah, yeah, like breaking stuff. And then I wake up in the morning and I drag myself into the bathroom and I look at myself in the mirror and I have compassion. I'm like, you're right, that sucks. You are a known author. You deserve to have your work be in places where people can find it. It doesn't feel fair. And you know what? You're going to be okay. And so the high five becomes this, it's like a, it's like a life jacket in the waves of life that keeps you above these waves so that they, yeah, they knock you over, they tumble you around, yeah. but then you climb back up, you reassure yourself. And I have this thing that is embodied in the high five. So the high five is also a wildly realistic, optimistic yeah. mindset. So part of what I am constantly doing, and I do this as a mother too. So we have a 23 year old, a 21 year old, and a 16 year old. And every day, in everybody's life, there is stuff that happens that sucks. There are friends that go out to lunch that don't invite you. There are people that tell you no. There are schools you don't get into. There are apartments that somebody else gets. There's boyfriends and girlfriends that break up with you. There are people that have cooler clothes and nicer cars and parents who throw the parties. And, you know, like it just, there's always going to be something that makes you feel like life is out to get you, things aren't fair, people don't like you. It's just like a tweak, right? It's triggering yeah. your insecurity. And I have this saying that I developed that, again, it embodies this high five, which for me, also having run a marathon, the only reason why I made it across that finish line is because every stranger's high five said, I believe you can keep going. That's what the high five said to me. Yeah. I see you, Mel. I see that you're limping. Keep going, girl. Like, And so my mindset, whenever I'm working for something and I don't get it, and I feel the sting of rejection or disappointment, I always say to myself, and I've, I say this to my kids on repeat too, I say, look, when you work hard, you're going to be rewarded. You have to believe that this moment is preparing you for something better, that you didn't get this thing because something better is coming. And, you know, so there have been a couple of those. Like, for example, the High Five Habit audiobook is unreal. I mean, I record it. It is the number one selling audiobook on all of Audible ever since it's been out in terms of the number of downloads in one month. Like it's just destroying it. And I know you don't like that word, but it is destroying <laughs> audiobook. It has been reported in the AP. It has been reported in all these places. Wow. It is in the charts, number one. And we are destroying it on the Amazon charts because people are reading it and loving it and sharing it. And I freaking love it because it tells me like the, you know, that the tool is spreading. Yeah. Because my books, like your books, are just vehicles for ideas to get yeah. out so then people can talk about them. And obviously, I put all this stuff online for free anyway. So if you can't afford the book, you're listening to this podcast. Yeah. Like you're going to get – but so the New York Times puts out a um, uh, a monthly audiobook list. I self-published the audiobook. And in the back of my mind, I was saying, don't get your hopes up, Mel. Don't get your hopes up. 
you're not a publisher. You're a self-published author. They're very fancy over there. And so the audiobook list came out for the month of October. I clearly destroyed it. Like I'm clearly the audiobook. We don't even make it. Like a complete and utter intentional snub. That was another night where I punched a wall and drank a couple of martinis and lit up a joint and called a bunch of friends and felt really sorry for myself. And the next morning, I literally high five myself in the mirror. It took about four mornings of high fiving myself to get over that sting because it felt personal. But I kept saying something better is coming, something better is coming. Do you know I figured out the better thing that's coming? Well, first of all, sales, actual sales are better than a list. So yeah. let's just get that straight. But I'm human. You know, we all want to be recognized. I was in the New York Times crossword puzzle today. <laughs> today? Yes. Isn't that not crazy? For the high five. I literally, it is the coolest thing. That's cooler than being a New York Times bestseller, I reckon. Don't you think? Yeah, I think it is. So I, It's a smaller club. I'm literally getting off the train and my text messages are blowing up from mates from the United States. And they've screenshot this and it says literally a three word down on the New York Times. And it said, um, motivational speaker, Robbins. And it was me. Aww. And you know what it was that, that, that made me so just blown away is that I underestimate the fact that people know who I am. I think that I am a person who has really screwed up a lot. And for a very long time, I have lived inside a body that was racked with anxiety and fight or flight and doubt and judgment. And it has been really hard to live in this body. Yes, I've been high functioning. Yes, I have still gotten okay grades. I've gone to great schools. I've had friends. I've been married for 25 years, but it has been a real bitch to live with this much unedgedness, yeah. this much stress, this much self-imposed condemnation, this constant, relentless drumbeat of what's wrong and someone's mad at me and I've screwed up again and just constantly feeling like nobody likes me and I can never do it right and it's all never going to work. And just this, just this grinding feeling that when I finally started to attack the anxiety and understand it. When I finally started dealing with the childhood trauma that created a dysregulated nervous system in the first place, when I finally understood what was going on and came face to face with the woman in the mirror and I started getting help and finding a new way because I didn't want to continue living a life where I felt that stressed out and that anxious and that worried and where the constant just noise in my head was negative. Now through the five second rule, through EMDR and psychedelic guided therapy, yeah. through traditional talk therapy, through the high five habit and practicing that since April of 2020, I have a totally different experience of being alive. And if I can save anybody the headaches, the heartaches, the struggles that I have been through, that I now realize that you have very simple tools at your disposal yeah. that you can use to move the needle on the things that are making you feel anxious and stressed and unhappy and just constantly on edge that you can come back home inside yourself and reconnect with your true nature. You know, if you think about our true nature, we're wired for love, we're yeah. wired for connection. We're, we, we're born accepting ourselves. Like when a four-year-old sees a mirror, they don't back up and say, God, my thighs are fat and look at that nose and my hair. Yeah. No, they like are, woo, they're twirling. They love themselves. That's your true nature. Yeah. 
That's why a high five from a stranger feels amazing because it cuts down to the core of who you really are, a person who deserves to be seen, a person who deserves to be celebrated. And it begins with you. Yeah, it's so powerful, Mel. Um, as you were describing your different experience of life now, you're still successful mm -hmm. as you were, mm -hmm. but you you experience it differently. There's a there's a calmness. There's a um, there's a groundedness, I guess, with it is, yeah. is what I hear. And it reminds me of a phrase that my friend Pippa Gray, and she's a psychologist. She used to uh, help the England football team a few years ago. Mm. And she has this term, winning shallow or winning deep. Sorry to interrupt. If you are enjoying this content, there's loads more just like it on my channel. So please do take a moment to press subscribe, hit the notification bell. And now back to the conversation. And it really epitomizes that she's she's mm. dealt with so many wow. yeah, yeah. It, it, it she's brilliant and it and it, it it's such a great phrase because it it's she's dealt with you know elite Premier League footballers mm -hmm. and um, you know they've been walking up the steps to win the trophy and on the inside they're feeling nothing they thought from a young age from the age of eight I'll keep training I'll keep training I'll get for a big club we'll get into the cup we'll win it because they thought like many overachievers that actually winning that medal, getting that number, getting that job, getting the house, getting the car would make them happy. But it doesn't because it's an inside job. And that's where I think this high five habit, it's not going to change everything, but it makes everything much easier. You know, you've still had therapy. Like I feel someone who, um, let's say they've got childhood trauma. Yeah, I do. Everybody does. And who doesn't really? Yeah, everybody does, yeah. On, on some level. And they it's too hard for them to even address it and mm -hmm. actually go and see someone. Well, yep. the high five habit, I think, is your way in. Oh, of course, yeah. My youngest just left the nest last night. I'm day one of empty nesting. How do I figure out what my project or plan should be when I have no idea where to start? Here's the interesting thing. Having no idea where to start is never an excuse not to start somewhere. So for my perfectionists who I love out there, who think there's a right way to do this, give that up. You can start anywhere you want. So if you're an empty nester and you're creating a whole new life, just start with what's one thing you're curious about exploring? Just one. What's one class you've already always wished you could take? What's one um, subject matter you've always wanted to learn more about? What's one charity that you've always thought you should volunteer at? And then move from thinking about it to taking action and doing it. Go from being a looker to a booker. Instead of thinking about volunteering, sign up to volunteer once. Sign up for one online class. Sign up for one cooking class. Um, sign up for one bridge class. Uh, make one meeting with one friend to start talking about the next chapter of your life. Buy one book about second acts and just get started. Thinking about it is not an excuse or a substitute for doing it. I want you to take just one action. Don't overthink it. That's it. That's how you start. Here's what I want to do. I want to give you some uh, ways to think about productivity that you might not be thinking about right now. Because the fact of the matter is, when I hear the word productivity, I don't want you to think about plowing through a to-do list because part of the reason why you don't feel productive is because you're busy doing the things that aren't important to you. Yeah, do you need to make sure you have milk or you got almond milk or oat milk in the fridge? Of course you do. But have you ever noticed that all the busy crap in life uh, tends to take care of itself? that you don't really need to focus your time and energy on the minutia that's on your to-do list because that stuff tends to grab your attention. What you really need to do is figure out how to create time and how to create the focus that you need in order to feel like you are making progress on the important things. And that's really what productivity means to me. You get all kinds of stuff done. You're really busy in your life, aren't you? But are you getting progress made on the important things? Probably not. 
because that's the challenge for most of us. And so first things first, when it comes to trying to have a breakthrough in productivity, you need a game plan. You need to have a very short list every week of what actually matters to you, okay? Because I guarantee you, if you were to do an audit of the way that you spend your time this week, you would probably see that 95% of your time is spent on things that you really don't care about. And even more scary, I bet you don't even realize how much time you are wasting just mindlessly scrolling through social media or sitting on the couch with the TV on, also answering emails. That is the least productive way to spend your time. Multitasking, spending your time just sort of zoning out on things that don't matter. What I want you to do is I want you right now to think about what is it between now and the end of this week, for example, what is it that matters to you? What's the most important thing that you would love to make progress on that you never seem to find the time, okay? It's a whole nother conversation for us to talk about whether or not you actually have time because the fact is you do have time. You have plenty of time to make small amount of progress every single day on what matters to you. What you do not have right now is you do not have a plan for prioritizing the important stuff in your life. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.